So I'm sure many of you will be aware that it's almost 200 years since James Parkinson first described a group of six patients in London with Parkinsonian symptoms. He very astutely described and noticed that walking becomes a task which cannot be performed without considerable attention. The legs are not raised to that height or with that promptitude which the will directs so that the utmost care is necessary to prevent frequent falls. And it's really very pertinent that he noticed that people need to pay attention to their walking when they have Parkinson's to prevent them falling. And I'll discuss why that's um, important shortly. Many of you will be familiar that Parkinson's UK have recently published their top 10 research priority areas. And top of that list was interventions to try and prevent falls and improve balance. We know that up to 60% of people with Parkinson's fall annually and two-thirds of those will fall recurrently, i.e. they'll have more than one fall. And data from a cohort trial in Sydney that followed people over a period of 20 years suggested that at 20 years, 87% of people will have fallen. So it's a major problem. And to understand why people fall, we need to look at the circumstances whereby falls occur. And we know falls are secondary to what's called intrinsic problems. So it's not that you're walking along, you get hit by a bus, or you trip over the carpet, or you trip over the cat, although sometimes clearly that can be a problem. But inherently with Parkinson's, there's disturbance of your ability to balance and walk safely, and that's the main precipitant of people falling. One of my old bosses, whom I used to work for, used to say, older people are like aeroplanes, Emily. Insofar as they don't crash on takeoff, they don't crash mid-flight, or be it recent evidence might suggest that is the case, they tend to crash on takeoff and landing. And falls in Parkinson's is no different. People tend to fall during postural change, getting on and off the toilet, getting in and out of bed, in and out of chairs. And the direction of falls is quite interesting and important as well. Historically, we always thought people fell backwards. But actually, when we looked at this in more detail, people tend to fall forwards 45% of the time, or more rarely laterally. And that's quite important because we know when people with Parkinson's fall, they stick their arms to the side of their body and they don't reach out to save themselves with a hand and therefore they're more susceptible to hip fractures. And falls are more likely to occur indoors and in the bedroom and I'll come on to why that might be in a second. But really importantly, one of the risk factors for falls is the performance of simultaneous activities. And by that I mean walking and at the same time having a conversation or carrying a tray of tea and scones but doing more than one thing at a time while you're walking and some of you are clearly are nodding and laughing as and recognize that very aptly so that's a really interesting point and something i'll recur um, refer to throughout the talk so what are the consequences well i've already mentioned falls are a massive problem But of course, falls in themselves lead to this corollary of problems, broken bones, and perhaps the most feared broken bone is that of a hip fracture, leading to hospital admission and potentially loss of independence. Hospital admission in itself is associated with risks of infection and so forth. Soft tissue injuries can really dent people's confidence. And confidence about getting about your day-to-day activities and engaging in things socially is so important because we know now that once people have fallen, they start to worry about falling again and develop what's called fear of further falling. And all that is is simply they start to limit their activities. Maybe they would have considered a long time ago that they could travel the world, but they don't quite feel as confident at an airport. And their world slowly shrinks down until first they'll only go into the garden and then perhaps stay confined to the house. And that may be a factor in why a lot of falls happen indoors and in the bedroom in that that actually represents people's just shrinking of their world, feeling less confident about going out and about. And of course, social isolation is hugely distressing and a massive factor that we need to try and prevent. And of course, falls cause massive worry and anxiety and impact on people who are looking after people with Parkinson's, their friends and their family. So stress for carers is important as well. So in order to try and come up with strategies whereby we can tackle falls, we need to look a bit into the background of why do falls actually occur in the first place? What is going on in the brain that makes people end up on the floor? During normal walking, there's an area at the front of the brain that controls what you're paying attention to. So if you think of your brain power, your thinking power, your cognitive function as this pie chart, for example, 
We know now from research done in the last 10 to 20 years that walking is not entirely a subconscious activity. It requires a little bit of your conscious attention to make sure that you stay upright and you don't fall over. So a tiny slice of the pie is paying attention to your walking, even if, even if you're not really aware that you're doing it. I was conscious, having just walked here, that actually it was a miserable day. And at the same time I was walking, I was thinking about, do I need to get some shopping on the way home? Wouldn't it be lovely to book a holiday, especially with weather like this? Do I need to get Christmas presents? Is it too late to start now? Have I etc. So we all often multitask when we walk, don't we? We think about other things, we carry trays, we have conversations with people who we're walking with. And normally, that's no trouble at all. This is the difficulty. If I was to do the same walk in teeteringly high heels, as you can see on the picture here, along a cobbled street, I would necessarily slow my walking down and might not be so confident about doing all those other things at the same time. I, I would pay a bit more attention to my walking, staying upright, and present, preventing myself from going flying on the cobbled street with high heels. Add a bottle of wine, for example, to that equation, something that never would happen, then actually you can see how a fall would be more likely to occur. And what I want to do now is draw a parallel to that scenario as to what happens in PD. So because of the dopaminergic, the neurochemical um, in the brain, because of the loss of that neurochemical, we know that gait is already unsteady. It's slower, it's a bit more irregular, so people are already at a higher risk of falling. And as a result of that, normally you recruit what's called attentional resource. So all that is, is slices of the pie, slices of your conscious brain power and attention to try and pay more attention to your walking to prevent yourself falling over. So you can see that in red with the bottom diagram. We know now that with Parkinson's it's not all about dopamine and there are other chemicals in the brain that are also deficient and one of those is something called acetylcholine. And the result of this, the loss of this chemical called acetylcholine means, means that it effectively takes some of those slices of the cognitive pie, your thinking power, away. So you just don't have as much resource brain power and function to try and compensate for that unsteady and uneven walking. So we know that because some of that cognitive impairment takes away some of the resource available, in situations where walking is particularly unsteady, you can't recruit that extra brain power and thinking to pay attention to walking and stay upright, and walking becomes unsteady. Similarly, if you try and do lots of things at the same time, so you're drawing on a lot of that brain power and thinking power, it's just not there. And those are the situations where gait becomes unstable and irregular, and we know that those are the situations where falls are most likely to occur. Parkinson's is a bit like walking on a tightrope the whole time. Now, if you were to ask a normal, healthy individual to walk on a tightrope like this, I'm sure none of them would really volunteer, especially not a across a gorge. <laughs> but had you convinced someone to do that in the first place, you wouldn't want them at the same time to be carrying a tray of water, holding a conversation, on their phone, on their email and texting, because you know what would happen. They'd fall over. Similarly, you wouldn't ask them to walk across a tightrope like this when they were intoxicated or drunk or tired even, when they can't pay enough attention to the walking. And that's simply drawing a parallel between what it's like to have Parkinson's be unsteady the whole time and what those threats are to walking, balance and staying upright. So knowing that that's one of the underlying causes of unsteadiness and falls, we need to ask ourselves, what could we potentially do to try and ameliorate that? Well, our hypothesis a few years ago was that if we can try and restore some of that deficient brain power and thinking, we may be able to let people pay more attention to their walking and their balance and potentially, therefore, make them steadier and, in a perfect world, prevent them falling. And it just so happens that we've got drugs that can do that. So drugs that are used to treat people with um, cognitive impairment and dementia, with diseases like Alzheimer's disease, replace that deficient chemical, the acetylcholine in the brain, 
And we know specifically that that improves people's attention, that cognitive resource. So our hypothesis was let's restore some of that attentional resource with a drug that's used to treat dementia, and let's see if that actually improves people's walking and ideally prevents them falling over. So every good trial, or every trial, has to have a pithy acronym. And fortunately, my mum is a great countdown fan. So I literally sent her all these words, the drugs and the gait and the falls and the balance, said, make me an acronym. And she came up with the RESPOND trial, which is excellent, in that we hope people will respond to the treatment. And this is the trial we undertook starting about three or four years ago now. And it stands for rivastigmine, which is one of the drugs we use to treat dementia, to stabilise gait, i.e. to improve walking, in people with Parkinson's disease. And our aim was to recruit people, 130 people, who had already fallen. Because we know that previous falls are a risk factor for falling again. So we were targeting a group of people at high risk of falls. And this is what happened if you wanted to take part. We use lots of avenues to try and recruit people. I visited lots of branches across the UK. We used the Parkinson's Research Network. We had a Twitter account that was a disaster. No one followed that apart from my husband and my best friend. <laughs> I went on local radio to try and recruit people. We put posters up. We asked specialists in the area whether they wanted to recruit for, on our behalf. And that was a lot of work. But when people were interested, we sent them a pack, and in that was some information about what was involved in taking part, and they sent a reply slip back to us saying whether they were interested. We then telephoned people just to screen for whether they were eligible to take part, whether they'd fallen in the past, whether they were taking those dementia drugs already or not. And then we invited them to come to the hospital for a visit. Those visits were quite in-depth and took a long time, around four hours, where we explained what was going to happen in the trial, and if they wanted to enrol, we then randomised them to active treatment with the rivastigmine, or an identical capsule that there was no active drug in it, but the drugs looked exactly the same. So the people in the trial didn't know what they were taking, and I didn't know what they were taking, and that continued throughout the whole trial, unless there was a very unusual or rare emergency. After that first initial visit, they went away with the medication, having done all those initial assessments that I'll explain in a second. And then for eight months, they took the drug. And every month, they increased the dose and also filled in a false diary. So every time they had a fall, they just wrote it on a piece of paper, told us a little bit about why and when it had happened, and then posted that back to us in envelopes. And then after eight months, we invited them back again to the hospital to have basically the same set of tests performed again. And at that point, they stopped taking the medication. We followed them up for a further four months to make a year in total. And then their involvement in the trial was over. So what happened when they came to the hospital for the first visit? Well, this is what's called an accelerom accelerometer, which attaches via a waist belt around people's waists. And actually, in reality, it looks very big on here, but it's probably the size of my fist. And it's very lightweight. And the advantage of using this to measure people's walking is it's very unobtrusive. So people don't really know, once they've got it on, what's happening with it. It, it just is a belt, and it stays on all the time. In fact, it's so unobtrusive that our fifth patient took it all the way back down to Cornwall, not realising he was still wearing it. So I had literally just got married and had to ask my husband at 6am on a Sunday morning to drive down to Cornwall, retrieve the accelerometer ready for Monday morning and drive all the way back to Bristol. So it really was very unobtrusive. So we measured gait and walking very sensitively using this device. And what we asked people to do was to stand on a line and simply walk down to the other end of a corridor about 22 metres away. So it was a fair distance. And they did that three times. And then the second walk, what we tried to do was just put them under a little bit of pressure to try and draw on that thinking power and that cognitive resource. So at the same time, we asked them to name words, starting with a certain letter of the alphabet. And we controlled the difficulty of words. So we chose the same letters all the time. So naming words starting with Z or X is not quite as easy as A or S. So we controlled the difficulty of the words. 
They did that three times. And what we noticed then was their walking became more unsteady because they didn't have that cognitive resource and brain power to draw upon. And then if that wasn't enough, we did it a third time and made the task even more tricky. So on the third occasion, we asked them to switch between two different letters of the alphabet, like apple, truck, so A and T, and they had to alternate. And that's quite tricky. You can try it on your way home if you so feel, in a safe environment with someone standing next to you. <laughs> and not wearing high heels. Anyway, point made. The gentlemen clearly were just saying that they don't wear high heels, which is very valid. So we tested walking in all those three conditions. And after that, we wanted to see if this treatment we were going to give people influenced freezing of gait, that feeling of your feet being stuck or glued to the floor. And to do that, we devised a pathway that was meant to elicit freezing that sticking to the floor. And we asked people to do this three times as well. So they sat down on a chair, they stood up, and then they had to walk through two narrow chairs, which mimicked very tight quarters, things like doorways that can often elicit freezing. It was very interesting. People, some people did indeed just sail through the chairs, no problem. Other people for one reason or another, climbed over the edge, walked round the side, got completely stuck. When they got to the bollard at the end, they made a turn 360 degrees to the right, and then 540, so a turn and a half to the left. Because we also know that freezing is often elicited during complex motor tasks, areas where you really need to pay attention to your walking, such as turning. So those were the walking tests. And to the credit of the nurses that helped me with this, we did this throughout the year, summer, winter, hail, snow, all weathers. When I go to conferences and talk about this, often people from you know, beautiful Swiss and Austrian clinics put up videos of people with Parkinson's walking to demonstrate one sign or another. And they're done in these beautiful sort of Swiss tiled white corridors, indoor, lovely. Ours was literally done in a concrete corridor outside French Hospital, which was built in the war, and we had to put a plastic roof over the top so people and the equipment didn't actually get wet. So whilst it was a fairly Heath Robinson setup, it really is testament to the motivation um, and the incredible sort of drive of people that took part that they did this in all weathers come what may. And then the other tests we did tried to look at other factors that may put people at risk of falling. So you can see here on the top left, there's lots of circles. And this is a more sensitive way of looking at vision. And we know that reduced vision is a risk factor for falls. People had to sit and decide which way the line went through the circles, and they get progressively more difficult. This is something called the Melbourne Edge Sensitivity Test. And all these tests were devised by some of our collaborators who are based in Sydney, Australia. They're called the Physiological Profile Assessment. The one on the top right is simply a reaction time measurement where the light comes on on the mouse and quick as a flash, you've got to press the button. The one where the lady is standing on the foam, there's a belt attached around the waist and on the back of that belt is a metal pole with a pen on the end. So we simply ask people to stand on that foam and we put that pen on graph paper and measured how much they swayed in 30 seconds. And for some people, that was really quite a lot. The bottom one on the left measures how well you know where your feet are in space. So people had to close their eyes, raise their feet up, and match their toes together on a perspex sheet. And then again, sitting on that chair, they had to stretch their thigh out against some resistance to measure what the strength in their thigh muscles was like. Because again, we know that muscle weakness is a risk factor for falls. And then last but not least was something called the Coordinated Stability Test. I don't know if any of you remember that sort of fairground fate type trick where you had to sit down and hold like the electric wire really steady and move it around without letting it buzz. Well, this is like a bigger physiological version of that. We simply moved the belt around their waist so it was facing forward, got them to stand on the ground, and then without moving their feet, they had to move their hips and their pelvis to manipulate the pen around this track. 
one of the major challenges for any clinical trial in the UK is recruitment. And we had to assess in excess of 931, so probably closer to 1,500 patients, to in the end recruit 130 into the trial. So once we got the 130 people we needed, half were given the active drug, the rivastigmine, and half were given the placebo. Actually, one of the strengths of this trial was our really high rate of retention of people. We had factored that along the way, around 30% of people would probably drop out because they had other things going on or other health issues or, or things would have just happened that they didn't want to take part in any way. But fortunately, and very successfully, that wasn't the case. So actually, whilst two people died, unfortunately, in the river stigmine arm and one in the placebo, we had a lot of people who came back to that final follow-up visit. So what were our findings? Our main outcome, the thing that we were most interested in, was this factor called gait variability. So for the third reference to alcohol of the talk, if you just imagine someone really drunk, they stumble, don't they? They sort of sway and stumble from left to right all over the place. And the time it takes them to take one step is very different from the time it takes to take another step. And had I had a portable mic, I will demonstrate it across here, but I'll demonstrate it at the end for anyone who wants to see it. But we know that people with Parkinson's, particularly people who, with Parkinson's who fall, have very high levels of gait variability. And that really reflects the brain talking to the feet. So that was what we were measuring as our, what's called our primary outcome measure. And rather wonderfully, it improved. And not only did it improve just when people were walking normally, it also improved when people were naming words starting with that one letter and also naming words switching between the two letters. So it improved across the board between about 19 and 28% in all three conditions. Walking speed also improved, which is another really good measure of people's function. So we know that people treated with the river stigmine on average walked about 11 centimetres per metre per second faster than people treated with the placebo, the dummy capsules. Balance improved, so that test I was talking about where you had to move the pen around that track got better. And we saw a potential increase in um, benefit in freezing of gait, i.e. treatment with river stigmine may have lowered the chance of people having those freezing episodes, which also can precipitate falls. But we need to take that last finding with a little bit more of a pinch of salt because we probably didn't have quite enough people in the trial to conclude that definitively. More importantly, and probably most excitingly, was our findings in respect to falls. And I'm really pleased to say that people who were treated with the active drug, the river stigmine, had a 45% reduction in their falls rate. And that really is very groundbreaking and very significant indeed. And there are two ways we can just look at this. This is a graph that shows the average number of falls people had in both arms over that eight-month treatment period. So you can see the active group who got the river stigmine capsules are shown by the red line, the river stigmine, and the placebo group are in the blue. And you can see that throughout those eight months, there's possibly a slight trend in the river stigmine group staying at least steady, if not declining. Whilst, unfortunately, the people who were taking the placebo tablets, their rate of falls increased. And again, if we just look at absolute numbers, you can see that the river stigmine active group, again shown in the red with the bar on the right, is lower than the blue bar, which is the placebo group on the left. And this really is a very exciting and rewarding finding to get at what has been quite a long um, journey. No drug, as I'm sure you're all aware, is without its risks, so it would be only fair if I presented what the problems were. And actually, we know from previous studies looking at this drug in other populations, particularly people who have dementia, that when you take it, some people develop really quite nasty tummy upsets, vomiting and nausea particularly. And our findings were very similar in that around 20 to 30 percent of people developed some nausea or vomiting. And in some people, that really limited their ability to continue with the capsules. Some other people managed to continue, but at a relatively low dose. And other people continued for a few days, and then those symptoms passed. 
And we don't quite know at this stage, really, what differentiated people who tolerated the treatment well versus those who didn't so much. So the successes of this trial really firstly were recruitment. So only about a third of trials that are major trials that are funded in the UK recruit successfully to target. And so I think one of our best accolades, if you like, was that we managed to recruit the number of people that we needed in order to show effects in some of those walking measures <laughs> and indeed falls. I'm a geriatrician, so my passion is the care of older people. And we know that a lot of older people have Parkinson's and that historically they really have been excluded from taking part in clinical research, even more so taking part in research that has involved drugs. And the reasons for that are very numerous, but they include things like transport to study sites and logistics and having other conditions that may interfere with their ability to take part. So we tried to be really quite creative about how we surmounted some of those challenges in order that we didn't exclude older people. So very early on, for example, we had a few people who came along who arrived in a complete state. They were anxious, they were shaky, they were worried, simply because they couldn't get to the taxi in time, and the taxi had been revving the engine, and they were all in a rush, and they were nervous about coming anyway, and by the time they arrived, they were just in pieces. So... We said, right, we will just simply recruit a friendly taxi driver, which we found, his name was Keith, and we'll just ask him to pick up everybody. So he picked up everyone who needed transport to come to the trial site. He'd wait patiently, he'd help them into the car, he wouldn't rev the engine, and then very usefully at the end of the day, when they returned home, were quite tired, he'd always make sure they took their tablets with them and didn't leave this big green box of trial medication in the taxi or forgot to take it on the train. And that's just one of the examples that we use to try and involve older people. So at enrolment, actually, our oldest person that took part was 90, and our youngest was 45. We retained a lot of people in the trial, which, again, was a real success, in that we factored that about 30% of people would drop out, and actually less than 5% did in the end. And that's probably for two reasons. One, we know that people that take part in clinical trials are really motivated. They want to take part. But also, throughout the trial, the participants had basically unlimited access to the trial study team. So if they developed a problem with the trial medication or, well, often anything, whilst on holiday or otherwise, they could just ring us up on a mobile and we would be able to help them. And lastly, I think it's really encouraging that we did this trial, we recruited time and target in six months, we recruited older people, we lost very few, and actually the results at the end of the day were positive. So in terms of patient experience, it was wonderful to actually have 130 people that we spoke to every month for eight months, and we saw at the beginning and we saw at the end, because you do develop a relationship and a rapport with people. And these are just a few of the positive, I should say, comments that people um, told us afterwards. So one person said, I found the whole experience interesting and was impressed by the care and attention taken by the team, both on my visits and when supporting from a distance, given, the, given that we've telephoned everybody every month to corroborate their falls data and see how they were getting on. And then many of you may have read this, the diary of a drug trial that was featured in one of the Parkinson's UK publications. And then even a specialist from another centre wrote um, of a patient that was in the trial, she tells me that since enrolling on the RESPOND trial that her falling has gone from approximately 20 to 30 falls a month to 3 to 4 falls a month. But there's always a pinch of salt. She's feeling less well in herself. So there isn't a golden solution, but people really enjoyed it. And the thing on the, the right, which I know is very difficult to read, was actually that people would write us poems about what it was like to take part and, and send us boxes of apples from their garden. It was absolutely wonderful. So what are the next steps? Where do we go from here? Well, we collected a huge amount of data in that four-hour window during the tests. And we can do additional analyses on cognitive tests markers of frailty and fracture risk. But probably the next biggest step for us to take is to do what's called a phase three trial, where we enrol a lot more patients, probably in the region of four to 500. And from that, we can try and determine what this treatment will be like in a more real world setting, 
Which subgroups of patients will benefit the most? At what stage of disease should we target this intervention? And we'll use falls as the main outcome instead of that arbitrary measure of gait irregularity instead. So, John Napier said human walking is a risky business. Without second timing, man would fall flat on his face. In fact, with every step he takes, he teeters on the edge of catastrophe. And no more, there's nowhere where that's more apparent than in Parkinson's disease. It has been an absolute privilege to work with those 130 people over the period of three years in the trial. And I'm really pleased that our findings in respect to falls are so positive. These are naturally occurring proteins that are in all of our brains that act a bit like baby bio being put on your tomatoes. What they do is they cause brain cells to sprout and regenerate. And maybe... So how do we start to appreciate some of these individual striking differences from one person to the next with Parkinson's? 